again doing something slightly different over these three weeks beginning last week God willing continuing into next week was that we were going to look morning and evening at the subject of mission or evangelism and in the morning we were going to look particularly at more of the details and some of the if you like the mechanics of evangelism some of the challenges some of the practical issues that we need to be aware of in our day but in the evening my concern was last Sunday and this Sunday that these two would function really as an opportunity for us to reflect on what is the gospel to have given to us through scripture a view of Jesus Christ and his saving power and then all being well next Sunday evening my intention is to uh, take up the subject of Abba Van it's very much in the news already and this week there'll be many documentaries there'll be a lot in the newspaper uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of that dreadful disaster on uh, the 21st of October it's right that we respond to this and are aware of this as Christians and I want to pick up some of the challenges and some of the issues that the subject of the Abavan disaster raises next Sunday evening trust to do that sensitively well from the Sunday mornings we've been looking at uh, Acts 17 and Paul's visit to Athens and we saw last week in particular in verse 16 that true evangelism begins in the hearts of God's people Paul was distressed in his heart by what he saw in Athens and as we were reminded this morning from 2 Corinthians 5 it is Christ's love that constrains compels the believer to regard no one in this world now from what he calls a worldly point of view the love of God works in the heart of the believer that's where evangelism and mission begins it doesn't begin by our consciences being challenged and perhaps made to feel guilty instead it begins in the heart with a real love for Christ and a love for people and a desire to reach out into the world with the news of Jesus Christ and him crucified now as we as a church look at this subject of mission however challenged we might be by the morning ministry however um, engaged and enabled to discuss the implications of that practically for our mission here to Llanelli and, and abroad it is this sense of the vision of Christ the vision of his work that is to be primary in our concerns that is the question of how well do we really know him how clear is our view of the glory of Christ ultimately are we really overwhelmed by Jesus we acknowledged last Sunday evening when we were looking at Revelation 1 that many of the great journeys of God's servants in the Old Testament began with a unique revelation of Jesus Christ the calling of Moses the burning bush the commissioning of Elisha was really when he saw the glory of Elijah departing and going up into heaven in the chariot of fire there was Isaiah's ministry began when he says I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple Ezekiel's ministry began with a series of visions it seems that often when God causes his people to engage in ministry and mission he begins the process with a glimpse of his glory and a view of his majesty I'd not really appreciated until this past week how clearly that principle is seen as embedded really in the Great Commission you know the words of the Great Commission at the end of uh, Matthew 28 therefore go and make disciples of all nation baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and so on but it is what precedes that that reminds us of this principle that mission is rooted in our view of the glory of Christ then Jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples those words all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me are a statement of absolute 
power and that absolute power is now attributed to Jesus Christ all authority not just authority but all authority it is comprehensive and it is the authority not just of those who believe but it is all authority in heaven and on earth he is the supreme authority it's why later on in the book of Revelation he is described as the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end so even in the Great Commission this principle is clear isn't it and the Great Commission was given against the seemingly comprehensive power of the Roman Empire Israel was under Roman occupation Rome was dominant it was a fierce brutal force with its false gods and its Caesar worship and there is this little group of believers a tiny handful really somewhat anxious and confused about the future as they face the reality of Jesus' ascension back into heaven and yet they're told to effectively go out and conquer the world but the encouragement is that the one who is sending them is the one who now has all authority not the Roman Empire not even the power of evil and Satan in the world which is very very great and very terrible Christ reminds his disciples that all authority has been given to him there is no one who can stand against him it is a wonderful vision and view of the greatness of Christ of his power and his his majesty now this principle is very much alive this principle of the vision of Christ being the primary thing before we move into the reality of the mechanics of evangelism was very much the case with John wasn't it himself here in the book of Revelation we saw last week that he was in a position of personal distress in chapter 1 verse 9 he tells us that he was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God that reference to because of the word of God was not that he went there to take the word of God there he had been placed there in exile because of his obedience to the word of God he's in a position of great weakness and difficulty the time of great difficulty not only for him but for the early church at this point historically many of the apostles had been martyred churches were in states of great need the chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation show that as it describes the condition of the seven churches in the area of Asia Minor in awful distress confusion and difficulty and upheaval and so it is in this time of difficulty that this vision of God's glory is given and it's given in the form of the book of Revelation to comfort but also to enable the church to engage in mission even in its great time of trial now the time of trial is very real it's a very real sadness isn't it that the book of Revelation is reduced by some Christians to be no better really than a puzzle to be solved or a playground for speculation instead the reality is that the book of Revelation is a book of glory and comfort for the church as she faces persecution that's why it was given it was given to encourage believers in the face of terrible times when it seems that the world and the forces of darkness were effectively snuffing out the church this book was given to support the church at times like this and here in this book we find that the purpose of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the great dominant theme and so in the face of great persecution we see in this book the purposes of God upheld Christ's victory over his enemies and the whole book concludes with the glory and the wonder of the new Jerusalem the heaven for all God's people the dwelling of God that is with men they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God 
the ultimate end of all things, the old order of things passing away in the triumph of Christ in and through the church. Well, the book of Revelation then unfolds the glory and the security of the Christian hope. And all of this is focused in Jesus Christ. And he is seen here page after page as being glorious, majestic, and wonderful. Like the first Christians reading the book of Revelation for the first time in the context of persecution and difficulty, we, I believe, in our day, very much in our secular culture, need to be reminded again and again and again that the gospel is great and that Jesus Christ is not small, but that he is majestic and that to him all authority and all power has been given in heaven and on earth. Now last week we saw in chapter 1 that when John saw the glory of Christ it was comprehensive and overwhelming. The effect on him was devastating. In verse 17 of chapter 1 he says, When I saw him, that is Christ as he is now, though rejected by the nations, despised by the philosophers, nevertheless this is what he is like now. The effect on John was that he fell at his feet as though dead. But we also saw that in that place of humiliation before the glory of Christ, we also saw the kindness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. John fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. There is the physical touch of Christ on John as he lies on the floor to reassure, but there are the words that reassure, do not be afraid. And the news is there's no need to be afraid. The resurrection has taken place. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. All the reassurance that Jesus gives to John is rooted in the magnificence of Christ's person. He is both almighty and all compassion. And we rejoice together as we looked at that in some detail last week. Now, as stunning as the glory of Christ's person is, we are now in chapter 5 moved to an even greater wonder. Something even more glorious than the view of Christ's person. Here in chapter 5, we are moved to consider his work, the glory of his work. And here we see in this chapter is glory that not only overwhelms John, but overwhelms the entire population of heaven and earth. Indeed, those things that are under the earth and in the sea as well. It is glory that is utterly overwhelming. Now the context of chapter 5, and this will be no surprise to you, is chapter 4. And in chapter 4, very briefly, what you have there is a description of God's throne in heaven. It's what dominates the view of heaven that John is permitted to see. In chapter 4, verse 1, he speaks about a door standing open in heaven, and through this he looks, and what he sees that is that the dominant thing is the throne in heaven. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Here is the ultimate expression of the kingdom of God. And at the center of the kingdom of God is the king and his throne and the description in chapter 4 of God and his glory is overwhelming and the response of the creatures and the elders around the throne to the view of God's glory is perpetual worship holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come and we're told that day and night they sang that never stopping there is perpetual praise and worship in response to the full disclosure of the glory of Almighty God. Now all of chapter 4 then is the context for our chapter, chapter 5. The context is 
the description of God's glory and heaven's worship of him. But when we move to chapter 5, we are presented with a question. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Now there has been many speculation over the years by Christian thinkers and theologians and commentators as to the significance of the scroll. We, we don't know precisely what it was about. The passage doesn't tell us in great detail. But the scroll becomes the focus of this question, who is worthy? Who can pick it up? Who has the authority to break the seals because they're worthy and read it? Now we know that in the time that John was writing, official documents were always placed on scrolls. They were pieces of papyrus that were stitched together and things were written and they were rolled up and preserved and they would be preserved for a very long time. Indeed, some scrolls from this time are still in existence today. You've probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran community and vast swathes of the book of Isaiah and other uh, parts of scripture were discovered still intact on these scrolls. It was a way of preserving important words. If you went into a, a synagogue in Jesus' day, there are references in the Gospels to the readings from the scroll. So the scroll is important. It's a, play, play, it's a way of containing information that is vital. And John does tell us that it is filled with words. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he says there was writing on both sides. So here it appears is a record and a message, but we're not told in any detail what it is. It's my persuasion that the scroll is probably the decree of the purposes of God in the universe throughout all time. It is a description of the will of God. You might say, why do you think that? Well, I think there are some hints in the chapter. It is securely sealed with seven seals. In other words, it is impenetrable to us as human beings. It is held in the right hand of God, which is a position and a picture of authority and power. God gets things done in the Old Testament by his right hand. And as the narrative in Revelation moves forward, it does so when the first seal is opened in chapter 6 and verse 1. I think this is suggestive that all of this points to the scroll being a description of the purpose and the will of God throughout all time and history. But the key question, and the thing that we are absolutely certain of, is the question in verse 2. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Who can take from the right hand of God this scroll? Who has the worth and the authority to open the scroll, to break the seals? and to read and to understand what I believe is the will of God through all time and history. John records his own response to this. Whereas in chapter 1 it was delight and amazement and the sense of overwhelming wonder at the glory of Christ, on hearing this question it is now utter despair. Verses 3 and 4, no one, in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. In other words, no one could be found who is worthy. And then John records, I wept and wept. And the language that's used there is of a deep, bitter sorrow being poured out in its absolute extremity. 
This is no silent coursing of tears down John's face, but he is overwhelmed with grief that no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. This is in reality, of course, a reminder of where we all stand before God. The entire human race. As John in this vision that he sees says, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. A great diagnosis, isn't it, that the Christian gospel makes on you and on me and on every other human being is that we're unworthy for all of our achievements and abilities, for all of our self-confidence as human beings and our mutual admiration of one another, for all of our experience through the centuries and learning that we have amassed as human beings, the scholarship, the discoveries of science and learning, the speculations of philosophers for all the things we are capable of as human beings. The repeated conclusion of the gospel is we are all still yet unworthy before God. Humanity has not thrown up one single person who is worthy. It's devastating. Hence John's tears and distress. Corruption and sinfulness is upon all of us and is part of us all. And it's this great single truth that the Christian gospel calls the world to face up to. The work of mission is rooted in bringing the world's attention to this. Our unworthiness and our powerlessness before God. We cannot fulfill the decrees of God. We break his laws. We have filled his creation with destruction and devastation. We have filled our hearts with pride and selfishness. We are all unworthy. And the acknowledgement of this, of our helplessness, always brings despair. I wept and wept. I wonder this evening if you've known this in your own experience about your own life. Do you know what it is to despair over your unworthiness before God? The repeated message of chapter 4 is that God is holy, seated on a throne, and his glory fills all of creation. You see, the Christian gospel is a necessary humbling to us as human beings. Its starting point with us is is not to fill us with a great deal of self-confidence. In many ways it is to strip it all away and to show us who we really are before God. And it's the reminder tonight, friends, isn't it, that the Christian gospel isn't just some healthy little addition in life to improve your self-image or your self-esteem. The gospel is utterly necessary for we are all unworthy and the understanding of this is devastating. But John's despair is not the end, is it? The gospel will not allow us to be left there in despair. In verse 5 we read, One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Weeping, in other words, is totally inappropriate now. Why? See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. There is one who is worthy. Friends, this is why the gospel is good news. This is why the gospel is hope for you tonight and hope for our world. This is why our world, in all of its chaos, in all of its mess, in all of its despair and confusion and uncertainty, that the Christian church can always say to the world, there is hope. For there is one who is able to open the scroll because he is worthy, and it is Jesus Christ. Here he is presented in Revelation 5 as Christ, the power of God. 
John sees Jesus. He sees him again. He has already seen him in chapter 1. Majestic and glorious. His face shining like the sun in all its brilliance. It is so devastating the view of Christ's glory in chapter 1. That John falls before his feet as one who is dead. But now. John perhaps anticipating in his mind. Who is this one who is worthy when we are so unworthy? Who is this one who is mighty when we are so weak? Who is this lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David? And he tells us, I saw a lamb. There is a tension, isn't there, here? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he is also a lamb and more than that a lamb looking as if it had been slain here is a picture of great weakness here is a picture of apparent total uselessness and powerlessness a dead lamb but this lamb is standing and he is standing in the center of the throne. The dead lamb lives and stands on the throne of God. He belongs there. It is his rightful place. The Lion of Judah, Israel's God, whose throne is the throne of heaven 2,000 years ago came into our world and he came for you and he came for me he came clothed in humility but in reality was full of colossal power the power of God to redeem humanity the lion of Judah came as the lamb of God the sacrifice for the world and he died for us the lamb was slain at Calvary. It was and is at the cross that God, who is all glorious and powerful, reaches out to us in our unworthiness and helplessness. As his hand comforted John, when he was unseated by the glory that is the glory of Christ but at Calvary his hands were nailed to a cross for us the lamb looking as if it had been slain is standing at the center of the throne and as the rest of chapter 5 unfolds we see he is the focus of heaven's delight and praise he is the center of everything not only in chapter 5 but throughout the rest of this amazing letter everything is centered around Jesus Christ the dragon who is Satan will come and seek to destroy him why because he knows of who he is and what he will do at the cross but Satan cannot destroy him the rebellion of the nations cannot deter him in his purpose to go to the cross. The nations cannot destroy him in his intention to go to Calvary. Nothing can frustrate the purposes of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the cross. Just as Christ is the center of everything, his cross is the center of Christ because of his death the news goes forward now there is one who is worthy who enab enables unworthy people to look into the scroll there is one who is able to make unworthy people worthy powerless people mighty and friends this is the reality of the power of the cross the Apostle Paul wrote it in these terms in Romans 5, 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. That's the news of the gospel to the world, isn't it? That sin has rendered us powerless before the purposes of God and his law. Sin has rendered us powerless to enter into the kingdom of heaven under our own steam and under our own efforts. But while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And his death is mighty victory. He is worthy is the anthem in chapter 5 and it is the anthem tonight it is the eternal anthem of heaven you are worthy verses 9 to 10 to take the scroll and to open its seals why why is he worthy because John wrote you were slain and with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth this is why he is worthy he is worthy in his nature but he is worthy in it because of his work his blood has purchased men for God that's the power of the cross it's bringing us back into right relationship with God it's redeeming us from the dark paths of sin his blood washes us clean and the work of Calvary goes throughout the whole world every tribe and language and people and nation bringing to them himself a kingdom and priests to serve him he is worthy Jesus Christ is worthy heaven's praise becomes obvious and spontaneous in response to the sight of the gospel the news of the cross causes heaven and the cosmos to erupt in praise and the praise is lavish and the worship is filled with thrilled delight in Jesus Christ and him crucified verse 11 I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and they encircle the throne and the living creatures and the elders and they sing loudly worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise Friends, the cross is not something small. The work of Jesus Christ by his death in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is not small. But it is something that throughout eternity will be attested to in unending, lavish, extravagant praise as thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels sing his praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven on earth, under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing. The whole cosmos joins in the anthem of the angels to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise, honor, glory, power forever and ever. Why? because he is worthy friends our view of Jesus Christ can never be big enough there is always room for more isn't there the lens can ever be made wider the volume can always be turned up when it comes to the glory of Jesus Christ and the one in whose presence we meet tonight and the one who we worship is the same one that right now heaven is lost in wonder love and praise about he has not changed the power of his blood has not been diminished by one degree the reality of what he accomplished on Calvary has not become outmoded or out of fashion it may be rejected by our generation it may be declared to be foolishness and pointless 
But the reality is, it is unparalleled in its consequences. For by his death he has purchased men for God. You see, our worship must be central to our witness. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He is not small. What he did on Calvary was not insignificant. He is worthy. So we must love him. And we must worship him. We must serve him. And fill the whole earth with the glory of his name as the waters cover the sea.